Good morning. My name is Donna. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Who's grateful to be alive, sober, and free on a Sunday morning? Oh, come on. We got more life than that. You want to be alive? You got to be awake. Who's grateful to be alive, sober, and free on a Sunday morning? Thank you. Oh, what a what a, what a privilege it is. Um, First of all, I want to thank the committee, and I want to thank those that are serving, uh, the, performing the quiet, anonymous service on this committee, behind the scenes, keeping this engine going, well-oiled, and running. So those that are serving behind the scenes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, the Tuscany as well. Um, I want to... Uh, I want to welcome all the first-timers to State Line. <laughs> Let's see who you are. Let me see the first-timers. Welcome. And I hope that you find here what I have found here. These power-filled messages of depth and weight. Power-filled messages of depth and weight. And I want to welcome anyone who's new to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know there's a few of you out there who are new to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hope that you find what I have found here is a happy, contented, peaceful, useful life. Not without the trials and low spots, because they're certain. But it's primarily a happy, contented, peaceful, useful life, and it's an application of this program and, and a, a reliance on a God. And I want to welcome anybody who's coming back to AA. Maybe if you left Alcoholics Anonymous and said AA doesn't work. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. So if I'm out there uh, trying to control and enjoy my drink and I'm not enjoying it anymore, welcome home. And if my self-knowledge and willpower have failed me again and I have succumbed to the desire to drink again, welcome home. And if I'm running around in those bedevilments sober, welcome home. And if you're desperate and you're drinking against your will and you are tired, welcome to a way of living that works. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. I came here powerless, and that means without power. A lack of power is my dilemma. I had to find a power in which to live. And there is no human power that can relieve me of my alcoholism, but there is one who has all power, and that one is God. May you find him now. And it's urgent, and we have a sense of urgency here. All that we ask that you do is grab someone's hand who has a working knowledge of this big book and is tapped into a power greater than themselves. And for a while, you can borrow the power of your sponsor and you can borrow the power of your home group. But there is a power that is accessible and we can never be separated from it. This book is information on how to gain access to a power. And it's up to me and my willingness to put it into application to bring about the transformation and then be that demonstration. My sobriety date is April 16, 1994, and I have a sponsor and I have a home group. And that home group is the women's meeting at the Canyon Club in Laguna Beach on a Thursday night at 6 p.m. And we don't have a meeting name. We do. We just didn't think that the central office would print it. <laughs> I'm really in a debate about what I want to tell you. <laughs> tell them. Our media's name is called The Slut, (laughs) but it's an acronym for Sober Ladies Utilizing the Steps. (laughs) We love our meeting name. So ladies, come on by, (laughs) and you can be one too. (laughs) And my sponsor, you know, and my friend Mary, um, my friend Mary said, I came in as a slut and I became a slut, like, me too. (laughs) And... Me too are the kindest words in Alcoholics Anonymous. Me too. There's identification. She liked me. She liked me. Did she do what I did? Did she, did she think like I thought? Did she drink like I drank? Did she do what I did? You know, I truly believe that every sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous is a demonstration of God's power to change a human being. But how do we change? Well, all through the weekend, we've had some powerful speakers, and there's been a you know a thread that's run it through it all. And there's the essentials of, reco- of uh, the essentials of recovery. It's found in the spiritual experience of this big book, the essential requirements: honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. That's how. 
Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. But I believe that willingness is the key that it talks about in the third step of the 12 and 12. Because if I'm not willing to be honest, I'm not going to be honest. And if I'm not willing to be open-minded, I'm not going to be open-minded. And if I'm not willing to be willing, nothing is going to change for me. And nothing did change for me in my first year of sobriety. But I want to tell you how I got into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll just hit, hit the highlights now. Because um, I am tasked with step 10. But I, there's a build-up to that because it was a powerful moment for me. But um, So I want to tell you just this, this you know, powerful, poignant moment in my life. When I was 12 years old, I had an epiphany on my parents' front porch. And I knew this deep in my gut, behind my belly button, this knowing three things about my life. Later on, when I would work with a sponsor, she would tell me that that deep in my gut, behind my belly button, knowing was an intuition. And ultimately, an intuition is a connection to a God. And I don't know that yet. I'm 12. But I knew these three things. I knew that it wasn't going to have any kids. I knew that um, my 30s were going to be great. And I knew that I was going to travel the world. I was going to travel the world in a business suit. I was going to carry a briefcase. And I was going to be much like Bill. I was going to be the head of a vast empire. I was going to manage with the utmost assurance. And I was going to prove to the world I was important. And I knew those three things at 12. And I went, huh. And I went on my merry way. Today... I believe that we are all born with this divine spark within us. And it's whether we fuel it or we smother it. And each and every time I take a drink, I dim the light of the spirit within me. And in the darkest of dark, there's always a pinpoint of light. And there's a power that is accessible, and we can never be separated from it. But it got really, really dark out there. And, you know, our book says the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind, not in his body. So what I want to tell you about is the things I was thinking about between the ages of 12 and 15 when I took my first drink. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I was coming up in high school, and, and I didn't feel like I fit in. You know, our, our 12 and 12 talks about anxious apartness. And I'm not pretty enough to be in your social group, and I'm not musically talented enough to be in the band, and I'm not coordinated enough to be in the drill team. I'm not enough. And I have no idea where that measuring stick came from, and I'm not enough. And that measuring stick, will, I will carry with me, and it shaped the trajectory of my life. And I'm not enough. So, I, you know, the very first drink I took was, uh, I was at the El Monte Horse Auction, and I, drink, uh, I was with a group of older friends, and I drank Southern Comfort right out of a bag. Let me, say, let me tell you what Southern Comfort did. Southern Comfort comforted. And it hit the pit of my stomach, and it was like, yes, and I love the effect produced by alcohol. It says men and women drink primarily to fear the effect produced by alcohol, and I will tell you that it let me exhale for the very first time. (sighs) Because I always was running at a level of less than, and uh, you put alcohol into this body, and I come up to the playing field. And I am, you know, I... uh, when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and I, and I read that, that line in the doctor's opinion um, that we are restless and we are irritable and we are discontent unless I can again experience that sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks. You guys put words to the way I was living sober. You see, that's how I'm living. That's what it says. I am restless, irritable, and discontent unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Yes, it stopped the chattering. It stopped comparing my insides to your outsides, and it just stopped, and I relaxed. And I love the effect. And I would continue to seek that which it did for me for the rest of my drinking career, that relief that it provided. So I... um, So I had, a, you know, I had, I had a good time for a little bit, and I was friendly, and I was funny, and life of the party, and, and, uh, and I got out of high school, and, and, and then I got, I got married at 20 years old. I met a guy in January, and I married him in August. If you're thinking about doing that now, I hope you have a sponsor. Um, but I didn't have a sponsor. But anyway, five months into that marriage, that man came home with hickeys on his neck and chest and told me they were bruises from work. And out came the measuring stick. And I'm not enough. I'm not pretty enough to be your wife. I'm not good enough to be your wife. I'm not talented enough to be your wife. You're seeking outside relations, and I don't know what to do. So I stay, and I tell no one. 
And on our first year uh, anniversary, I didn't know what to get him for a gift, so I asked for a divorce. And he obliged. And I went on, I moved to my parents' house, and I cried myself to sleep for six months. Poor, poor, poor me. Poor, poor, and pitiful me. And one morning I woke up, and I, um, I had these big, puffy, cry eyes. And I said, pour me a drink. I'm going to kick butt all over this town. And that's exactly what I proceeded to do. And I will tell you that um, I ran amok. And I'm a female alcoholic, and I'll do anything I need to get what I want. And my life got really, really dark. I was, um, I'm not proud of this, but it's part of me and my story. And, you know, I was, uh, I was a mistress to several men. And I'm dating men of wealth. And they're taking me to the Bel Air Hotel. And the very same night, I'm ending up at the Pico Rivera Rim Ram Room. Somebody knows the Rim Ram Room. <laughs> Standing at the Bel Air Hotel, and by the end of the night, I'm drinking by myself in a, in a dark, dark bar in Pico Rivera, and it's got cork and mirror walls, patent leather seats, barf in the bathroom, and urine on the floor, and that's the way I like to drink, because it's dark in there. You know, you know, I'd like to... Oh, man. And then, you know, some, you know, it talks about, you, we, uh, in, in our book, it says we have to all, uh, it says um, we can't blot out the, con- bring into the consciousness of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago, and I can't drink away this guilt, shame, and remorse. And so I call all this, this nonsense off, and, and uh, I start, um, well, I start ta- knocking on hotel room doors in Pomona. I'm coming to at the top of Mount Baldy, not knowing how I got there and knew who I was with. And, you know, and then somehow I meet a guy and I met, went on one date and I moved out and on the sec- I moved in with him on the second. Through this time, I'm getting DUIs and, and I'm going to jail and I get exposed to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I come in here and I, and I don't hear, I hear the differences and not the similarities. I'm, I don't even hear a sponsor, uh, steps, God, unity, recovery service. I don't even hear a detox, sober living, or rehab. I, I hear nothing. But I listen to your stories of pain and I'd be like, yeah, man, I drink too. And then I hear your stories of joy and I'd be like, absolutely great reason to drink. And I don't even know you're sober. And I know now, and we talked about it through the weekend, again, through some powerful speakers. But I got to come all the way in and sit all the way down and become a member here and not an attender. Because I know now that when you share your stories of pain, it's divided amongst us. And when you share your stories of joy, it's multiplied by all of us. I got to come all the way in, sit all the way down. But I don't do that for another two years. Um, Jack called me up one night from work and he said, I'm not going to watch you kill yourself or anyone else. I'm leaving. And he left. He left the house I moved into. And, uh, and our book says we have two alternatives. One is to blot out the consciousness of our intolerable situation the best I can or accept spiritual help. And I don't know if there's any help here. I don't even think I need any. And I'm living in Huntington Harbor on a single income. And it is, uh, you know, I got rent or booze. Rent or booze. Booze. I moved to Seal Beach. And Seal Beach is an old town, a lot of money and a lot of booze and a lot of blackouts. And um, I lived there uh, for two years, and I could tell you two things, Hennessy's and Main Street. And on April 15th of 1994, I was in a roommate situation, and I blacked out one more night, and my roommate and her boyfriend put me to bed. And when I came to the next morning, I'd had the DTs before, and I hadn't had them hadn't had this, I hadn't had them this violent. And uh, I, I somehow I managed to hold on to a job. And I knew I had to get to work, and I was shaking violently, and I could not stand fully erect. And I went to walk my way into the shower. And when I got in the shower, when I when the body when the water hit my body, it felt like I'd been hit by pellets and pins. And when I went to wash my hair, my hair hurt, and I knew it would fix it, and it would be another drink. And I went down, and I bought another bottle of Bacardi, and the rest of the story has been fed back to me by those involved. My employers broke into my house, and they broke into my room, and they tapped me on the shoulder, and they said, pack your bags, you're going somewhere. 
And I had, I had that deep in my gut, behind my belly button, knowing it was all over. And I asked no questions, and I dutifully followed directions. I packed a duffel bag with my bottle of Bacardi, because I have no idea what's happening. And they said, go through the door, or get in the car. And there was that moment, you know, again, I don't have time to tell you about my, uh, my, the things that I was doing out there, but I'm a female alcoholic and I'll do anything I need to get what I want. And our book talks about, um, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And I believe that we have all experienced it. Maybe once, maybe twice. It gets us here. The most demoralizing moment for me was being escorted into a detox by my employers. And they talk about there are no dues or fees there. Yeah, there are. I paid them out there. Pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, the acronym for that is PAID. I paid a huge price. Paid a huge price. And um, so I get in there, and they, um, they, they take me in, and they were doing my in- intake, and they asked me if I needed to make any calls. I call, and a lot of you guys know this story, but... Um, you know, I, I I fought them for a while. You know, finally I, I conceded and I called my parents and they said, you know, they said, where are you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> they said, well, well, I find out. They said, you're, um, you're new beginnings. So mom, dad, they tell me I'm in new beginnings. And they said, well, where are you physically? We'll fly down. We'll assess the situation and see how we can help you. And I'm like, you just stay where you are. They moved out of state like 30 years ago. And uh, I said, where am I? And they said, you're new beginnings at Clark and Candlewood and Lakewood. And my mom said, at Clark and Candlewood in Lakewood? I said, that's what they said. My mom said, in 1964, you were born there. There was Lakewood General Hospital, and that was another moment where God was getting my attention. God was getting my attention. And so, um, you know, I was there, and, and I thought, man, if this place is called New Beginnings, if this is, maybe I can get a new lease on life, a new beginning on life if I just stayed. So I stayed, and two weeks later, the insurance kicked me out. And I will be forever grateful to Bill and Bob who talked about attraction and not promotion. And her name was Eileen, and Eileen ran this aftercare program. And I wasn't required to attend it, not by my insurance and not by my employers, no one. But she was my, she was my attraction. She had this genuine in, uh, inner peace. She had this genuine, authentic smile. She radiated, and I, I, she was happy. You didn't have to ask her. You could see it. You could feel it because she vibrated, and I wanted what she had. So I sat next to her week after week after week, thinking I'd get it by transference. I was going to meetings, doing my day runner and my checkbook, and I'm sitting next to her at these little aftercare things and thinking I'd get it by transference, and, and on my one-year sober anniversary... I am restless and I am irritable and I am discontent unless I can again experience a sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few steps. I was on the phone that night with another alcoholic and I said, if this is what sobriety is all about, I don't want any part of it. I'm, I'm miserable. This sucks. They said, why don't you get a sponsor? Why don't you work the steps? Why don't you go to some women's meeting and get involved in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous? And your life will change. And on the phone on that night, my willingness was born, and I was all in. I was all in. I was desperate. They promised me a change here. So I got a sponsor, and I started doing the work here, and she was doing her job, and I was doing mine. And I will be forever grateful to those that record, because I grabbed onto those cassette tapes. We talk about the, you know, cassettes. They weren't eight tracks, but they were cassettes. And, uh, and I glommed onto these cassette tapes. Because I had a long trek from work to home. And two speakers broke down the steps in a manner in which I heard and which uh, made the steps come alive, made the steps palatable, like I could drink them up. They were like syrup on my pancakes. And if you know me well, I, I do syrup shots at, at YPA events. YPA is Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous, and they think that's hilarious that I'm shooting shots of syrup, but anyway. So I start to, I, you know, um, t- two speakers broke down the steps like this, and they, they really made this um, energy for me. One is me, two is God, three is me and God, four and five is me, six and seven is God, eight and nine is you, ten is me, eleven is God, and twelve is you, and there's no one else to play with. 
And the other speaker said, one is, I am the problem. Two is come to believe there is a solution. Three is a decision to seek that solution. Four through nine, take care of the past. Ten takes care of our daily life. Eleven takes care of our spiritual life. And twelve takes care of our AA way of life. Now, AA is the way I live. It is not something I do or attend. It is the way I live. Like, I can come up here and talk a good game. But how am I living? Where's Kent? Oh, he left. I ran him into a, in the elevator. How am I living? Am I practicing a spiritually disciplined life? Am I practicing kindness, courtesy, justice, and love? How am I treating the 7-Eleven clerk? How am I treating the elderly? I'm a dog owner. Am I using the blue bag? (laughs) Our book says, we're in the world to play the role God assigns us. And I'm given roles all day long. I'm a daughter, a sister, a wife, an aunt, a friend, a sponsor, a sponsee, a volunteer, a citizen. Am I given 110%? How am I living? How am I living? So I got into the action here because I was promised a new way of living. So I did the work, and I and I will say that, you know, I, I will be forever grateful to um, we agnostics. Because we agnostics, you know, all through that chapter it says, lay aside a prejudice, express even a willingness. Cast aside an old idea, welcome in something new. I came out, I, at 13 years old, I came out of a religion I did not understand, nor did I believe in. And my, said, my parents said, opt in or opt out. And I opted out. So when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, they, they offered me this lay aside of prejudice, express even a willingness. And, and I come in here, and I have this idea of a great big God, but I, I didn't just feel like I was worthy of God's love. And so it said, I could have a limited conception. Start there. And so I did. I picked the wind because I can't see, feel, or touch the wind. And I can't see, feel, or touch the God that's working in you. One of our speakers said, oh, it was Dawn. Dawn said, you know, it was you. Paul, I think, talks about you're my hope in human form. It was you that I could have this, I could start to establish this relationship so I pick the wind until I can ha- establish this relationship and start to grow towards the image and likeness of my creator. The third step says, the prayer says, relieve me of the bondage of self. It never says, relieve me of the bondage of alcohol. And it reminds me that I am the problem. It reminds me that I am the problem. And I want to let you know what that looks like at 16 years sober. Because this is where my step 10 gets really powerful. At two months sober, I got a job as a file clerk. That was the best I could do. File clerk for temp service. So I'm this file clerk, and this temp service puts me into a a global corporation. And, um, And I'm just doing my filing, filing, filing. And AA taught me some good work ethics. Show up on time. Do your work. Give them an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. So I'm just doing my filing, filing, filing. And that company um, saw saw my work ethics, and they hired me up and out of that temp service and into the global corporation. And so I start working overtime. I start asking questions of different departments. And I start climbing that corporate ladder. Like I said, knew I would on my parents' front porch. And at 16 years sober, I'm the senior manager of a global corporation. And I got power, prestige, and a pocketbook to back it. And I start treating my employees with rudeness and curtness, and I'm condescending, and I'm demanding. And mind you, I want to remind you that I am going to meetings and I am sponsoring women and I'm doing prayer and meditation and, and yet I'm treating my employees with rudeness, curtness, condescending, demanding, insulting. And eventually they don't like it and they took me to HR and I got written up. 
and I have never been written up in my entire working career. And our book talks about that fear, that, that, uh, the fear of the, the fabric of our existence is shot through with it. You bet. Because I fear of losing that power, that prestige, that pocketbook. You bet. That fear rolled out into the women I sponsor, rolled out into my friendships, rolled out into the family. Because so I'm taking everybody hostage. Don't you know what they did, and this is what they said, and this, and everybody was my hostage. And eventually, that fear rolled around and back into work, and I start treating my employees with rudeness and curtness, and I'm condescending, and I'm demanding, and I'm insulting. And through a series of events I don't have time to tell you about, I was fired in sobriety, boom, on the floor in a fetal position with bubbles coming out of my mouth. I didn't drink. I had no idea what had happened. And I called my sponsor and I said, I feel like I've been cut off at the knees. I feel like I've been gut punched. I can't breathe. And she said, girl, you've been leveled to grow. You've been leveled to grow. There's a bottom below you, the bottom you know. There's a bottom below the bottom you know. And I had no idea what would happen. I know now. I was plugging into the wrong power. It was human power. Suddenly, over time, it had shifted back to this human power because the booze, the money, and the men, all that human power can't relieve me of my alcoholism. But over time, it had shifted, and it had become power. Because, see, I was going to meetings. Again, I was going to meetings sponsoring women. When I get all prayed up, I go out my front door. There's people out there. Um... I go out my front door and I get into the threshold of my job. And it becomes power, I become power. First email, first phone call, it's power, I'm power. There's spiritual warfare going on in that job. And I'm fired. And I don't know what to do. So I'm taken back through that big book. And there was a line in that book I missed. It says, the wording was, of course, quite optional, so long as we express the idea of voicing without reservation. I was asked to write my own third-step prayer. And I did that in the middle of an Albertson's parking lot, and I was cracked wide open for a brand-new experience. A brand-new experience. What I know today, because I love to talk about, uh, you know, um, you know, steps one through nine, we talked about that, and... Ten is our daily life. It's our walking around step. It's my demonstration to God that I'm still willing to do this thing. I ask to be changed. I want to be changed. We're entirely ready. You know, ten drops us back to six and seven. Am I willing to be changed? Did I ask to be changed? God needs our cooperation. Do I act as if I am changed? And if I'm not, because my sponsor said, if you're not willing to be changed, you're getting a payoff somewhere. And I like, you know, do I want to roll around in self-pity and marinate in that? (laughs) Do I want to roll around and marinate in self-righteousness? Did I turn my will and my life over to God? So I started to do, you know, I, I feel, this is my... Opinion in my experience. I feel like step 10 is the least used and often overlooked step. When I was struggling at that work thing, everybody said, did you pray and and meditate about it? Did you pray and meditate about it? And I, um, it's, I didn't do anything. I, I, I prayed and meditated about it. What am I taking to step 11? I got to flesh out the meat. I get, you know, our, the instructions of step 10 are continue, improve, or continue, 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 continue. You know, our steps 10, 11, and 12 all have verbs, right? Continue, improve, and practice. Continue, improve, and practice. But our steps says continue. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God and wants to remove them. Discuss them with someone immediately. Make amends if we have harmed anyone and uh, turn our thoughts to someone we can help. 
There's verbs there. Watch, ask, discuss, make, turn. There's verbs. I gotta, I gotta take the meat. I gotta take the meat to step 11. Prayer and meditation. All I was doing prayer and meditating. I wasn't finding the problem. I wasn't digging it out. The problem was me. The problem was me. My daily step. In our 12 and 12, it talks about, it talks about admission and correction, uh, uh, admission and correction of errors now. There's some urgency in 10 too. Immediately ask one, or immediately, you know, at once. There's some urgency. I am. Our external behavior is a result of our internal condition. My external behavior is the result of my internal condition. I think we heard about behavior before, uh, earlier. But my external behavior is a result of my internal condition. And I'm asking, what's the condition? It means I'm blocked. Ken talked about being blocked in the fourth step. I mean, on page 64, 71, it says I'm blocked. Because I gotta keep, I gotta use this step, step 10, to keep that channel open for grace to flow. Because if I don't use this step, I use it like a sewer pipe, right? If I don't use this, you know, this step to keep that channel open for grace to flow, I'm gonna get corked up. And I'm gonna pop sideways at somebody. And it's not gonna be pretty. And somebody's gonna pay a price for my internal condition. It says this is how we react so long as I'm in fit spiritual condition. And then five lines later it says we have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. So i got to use this channel for grace to flow. And some examples of that. I am... In about oh I don't know, they're they're so they're they're powerful in your face. Um, I uh, was a caregiver. She's still with us, but I was introduced to this woman to be a caregiver, and I, she was ninety two years old, and I was with her till she's ninety five. She's ninety eight now, um, and she's ninety two. And when ninety two year old, have you ever if you if you haven't been a caregiver? It's a lot of fun. You get to watch the aging process, and you get to ask them about their wisdom, and you watch what they do, and they have calculated moves, and and they have, they're stuck in their own, you know, in their in in you know their lifestyle. Well, we had to change um, uh, providers, and they didn't ha- offer a channel that she wanted. One of her favorite channels, and if you've ever worked with the elderly. They get what they want. Somebody said, yeah. yes, ma'am. They get what they want. And so she wanted this channel. And so I'm on the phone with the, uh, I don't know, first level customer service at an internet provider. And I'm not getting what I want. And I'm not getting it right now. And I'm like, don't you understand? This woman needs it. I need it for her. <laughs> And I am trying to insert my will to get a channel added to a provider. And I am, uh, I am frustrated. They're not doing it fast enough on my terms and on my time. And I start getting really snippy. And I'm getting curt. A couple of foul words came out of my mouth. And I was sitting there as it's coming out my mouth going, Dawn, this person on the other phone can't help you. He can put in the order for it, but he can't help you. And I had to correct my behavior. Admission and correction of errors now. So I tell the gentleman, I said, sir, I am... You did not deserve my assault, my verbal assault on you. You didn't deserve that. I apologize. And I hope you have a good day and not another nasty customer like me. But I wish you a good day. And he laughed. (laughs) He said, oh, you won't be the first, right? (laughs) 
another experience in this position was I, I, I towards the end of my uh, my tenure there. She had to, she had broken her leg and she had to rehab and and so we were called to do twelve hour days, and I did Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, back to back twelve hour days, and I had the seven a.m. to seven p.m. shift, so I had most of her waking or all of her waking moments, and so I'm with her, and then the other shift was seven p.m. to seven a.m. And they slept. So I, one day, I'm not in fit spiritual condition. Maybe I didn't pray hard enough. I don't know. But I come in, and I'm looking around. I make her lunch, her breakfast, her lunch, and her dinner, and she likes home food made. And I wash the dishes. I do the laundry. And I'm thinking, all of these people... This night shift gets to sleep. I am with her on every waking moment. I'm doing all this work. I'm doing the laundry and I'm folding and I'm cleaning. I'm doing all this stuff. I need more money. So I'm going to get on the phone. I'm outside. I got the phone going and the, you know, it's dialing. And I thought, because I want, because I deserve it. Me, I. And I, something hit me and it says, Money won't fix this. Spirit will. It just hit me. And I hung up the phone and I thought, do your job. Come in here and do your job. This is what you get paid to do is be with her. Enjoy the cooking, the cleaning. So I can serve her. I get, you know, I got paid for it, but I served her. But one of the things I'm really embarrassed to tell you about is that later on, you know, I I did five years. But towards the end, and this isn't why I wasn't transitioned out. Some some other things happened, and I was transitioned out of the position. But I am embarrassed. And it's why I ask you, how do you treat the elderly? Because what was happening for me is towards the end and during these 12-hour days, I was starting to get a little bit snippy and I was starting to get a little bit forceful. And I wanted her to, you know, come on, you know, and I wanted to speed it up a little bit. Or, um, do you remember this? And I was getting a little sharp with her and a little edgy. And when I did my 10-step, because it was making me really uncomfortable inside. I'm like, what is happening to me? And I'm projecting on her. And what occurred to me is I was trying to stop a mental decline. I was trying to stop it. And I didn't know. So I had this experience where I had to let it be and watch her. But I'll tell you, trying to stop a mental decline on my, on my terms and my will, it ain't happening. I was embarrassed when I discovered that. So I took it to prayer and meditation. Help me to be kind. Help me to be loving. Help me to help her to the next phase of her development. And... um. So then I was transitioned out, and a couple of you guys know this, that about a year ago, I, my husband, I didn't have any kids, and I married, and and Steve has too, and and he's got a daughter who provided him his, his, the grandchildren, and and I was texting her, because now, you you know, she's got, we've got uh, Liam, who's five, and Matt, no, Liam's six, and Madison's two now. But anyway, about a year ago, so I'm texting her because nobody answers the phone anymore. So I'm texting her, and she ghosts me. Do not ghost me, please. I get a little edgy, and I feel very insecure. One of my defects of character is is when I get insecure, I feel like I don't matter. 
And I was texting her, and I wasn't getting any responses. And I started to get a little bit of self-righteousness and a little bit of judgment. And then I started to manipulate prejudice with my husband, trying to get him to see my side of things. Why isn't she texting me back? You need to fix that. Or, you know, I'm just trying to pull him in to have him see my side of things and where I'm standing. Am I not important that she doesn't respond my, to my text? And when I walk a step, uh, you know, step 10, and I dig it out, is I am unforgiving. Because I forgot. I forgot. She had just become an ER nurse. Working the night shift, is married, has two children, five and two. Five and one at the time. Thank God I practice restraint of tongue, pen, and the send button. How many of us have damaged a relationship via the send button? Hmm? (laughs) I see a lot of hands and two going up like this. (laughs) I restrained. But sometimes my restraint of tongue, pen, and the send button looks like silent scorn and judgment. Hmm. My sponsor says, be curious and not judgmental. Be curious and not judgmental. I had to ask the questions. i got to continue to practice this thing in my daily life. I wanted to, How come we can't take you know, our love and tolerance into our families? You know those twisted relations it talks about in the 12 and 12? Thanksgiving, this is really embarrassing, but I'm here to tell you my truth about working this step 10 on a daily basis so that I can take it to God, so that, you know, I can be changed and bless them and change me. Bless them, change me. And I, um, Thanksgiving, I was, you know, I have a, I have a, a, a weekly call with my mother. I keep her current where I'm at. Uh, and on one Sunday morning, she called me, and we were talking, and she said, Hey, can you come to Thanksgiving? I'd like you, I'd like you to come to Thanksgiving. I haven't been to Thanksgiving. They've been gone 31 years. And I get a guard up. Like, I'm being called up for bad news. That was what I discovered in my 10th step, but here's what happened. I get a guard up. And I go up, and I fly up there. This is, what, two weeks ago? And I feel like I walk up there with an edge, or go in there with an edge. Now, my sister, uh, my sister, my entire family moved up there, and I stayed here. They moved, thirty, like I said, 31 years ago. And my sister lives a mile down the street. My brother lives 20 minutes away. Uh, They live in Woodenville. My sister lives a mile, and my brother lives in Duval. So everybody's all up in there. Uh, Pacific Northwest, we love it. (laughs) And uh, I... um, so I fly up there, and I, I must have had a, an edge. I don't know. And it seemed to be that I, uh, that I, there was a divide. And, you know, I wanted to spend time with my mom, thinking something's coming. I don't know. Um, and I've got this edge. And some things happen, and, and I have this awkwardness with my sister. And I... Uh, I have this awkwardness, and, and there's, it feels like a divide. And anyway, my, my sister uh, went, at one point breaks down sobbing. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, I said, what's going on? Is something happening there? And, and I'm trying to help her, and, and she's like, just drive. I'm like, okay. So anyway, I, I, later on that night, I asked my mom. I said, I, I said, Mom, what was your perception of what happened earlier? And she goes, well, she says, my perception is I think you're jealous. I said, what? I said, my perception is 
She wants to in- intervene on my time with you. So there was this, this oddness, and, and so I took that. You know, that, mo- that thing you go, huh, the thing that takes our breath away. Huh. So I'm doing a step 10, and I'm asking God for direction and help, and I get home, and, you know, we have all these, you know, God walks amongst us, right? God with skin on. So I come home, I call my sponsor, I tell her what's going on, and she said, well, families aid in our spiritual development. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Later on that night, I'm at a speaker meeting, and this speaker was talking about, uh, he was talking about drinking on an abuse, but the message I heard was, he said, you have to reach down for a level of commitment to drink on an abuse, but what I heard was level of commitment. God was skin on. And then the next night, I'm on the phone with a, a, with a, with a woman I just recently uh, started sponsoring. She's got about nine years. And we tell her, or we were, she said, how was your trip to Thanksgiving? And, and I told her. And, you know, this awkwardness. And she said, oh, my gosh, I'm, I, I was the same way with my sister. And we found out that we we were, you know, we're both the firstborn. We're obviously female. And then we have a secondborn, which is the sister, and then the thirdborn, which is the brother. And they're all the same age ranges. And it was, you know, kind of synchronicity. And she, and I, and she said, I had that problem too with my sister. And she goes, now we're best friends. And I said, well, what happened? What'd you do? How, you know, what'd you do? And she goes, I invested in the relationship. <laughs> okay. I heard you, God. Families aid in our spiritual development, level of commitment, invest in the relationship. So I've been been trying to connect with my sister on a weekly basis. As a matter of fact, she was here uh, uh, with us. She she had come here, and I said, hey, I'm traveling to Vegas, uh, thinking about you and our memories from a couple of years ago. And she said, love you, sis. A little bit of progress. A little bit of progress. My daily walking around step, demonstration of God's, to show God I'm still willing. I don't want to be corked up. I want that, I want grace to flow. We have recovered and been given the power to help others. My job is to grab someone's hand and put them in the dark, or put them out, pull them out of the dark. I know that when I apply the steps, when I apply the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, they have always provided me a quiet mind and a skip in my step and joy in my heart and peace in my soul. But I must apply. And then I can grab someone's hand. I was delivered here by someone else doing God's work. And if I can keep my channel open for grace to flow, let God use me and work. Use me. And may we grab that hand and be a light to guide the feet that are afraid. And then put their hand in the hand of God and leave it there and let them do that for someone else. Because we're all here just to walk each other home. Thanks for letting me share.